myself out. I am afraid of this. I'm terrified and paralyzed by. I am deathly afraid of. Welcome to the Sum of All Fears podcast with your host, me, Ryan Perio. Hello and welcome to the Sum of All Fears podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Perio. This week, my guest is comedian and musician Jeffrey Eggleston. Jeffrey is a comic who started in Little Rock, moved out to L.A., became a musical comic act, and now lit, resides in Austin, Texas. Um, he has opened here at Hyenas a few times, but has now made the move to middle act or feature. And so now he's doing a little bit more time and having a little more time on stage with that guitar. In this episode, we talk to him about music and comedy and acting. And then we get into his fear of being wrong. So let's get into my interview with Jeffrey Eggleston. All right, my guest is comedian Jeffrey Eggleston. Jeffrey, how are you doing today? I'm good, man. Living the life, living the dream. <laughs> yeah, the dream has some has some reality has some reality during the days. It's it's kind of nice it, though. I mean, it, yeah, it's not always a good dream. Yes, I should specify, but uh, it is a dream. How are you like in Austin? I know you're a recent transplant oh, here. Oh man, I'm loving it, man. Uh, I love the people. Uh, I love how many stages there are. Um, I'm, I'm just getting up. I'm doing so many sets, so many more sets than I was in LA. Uh, I'm getting to get on the road cause there's so many places close to Austin. I was just mm -hmm. in San Antonio at the blind tiger last night. So yeah, I get to do hyenas. Like I'm, I'm loving it. I'm loving Texas. Oh, I'm glad you're loving it. So did you start comedy in LA? No, I started actually in Little Rock, Arkansas. Most people, most people don't know this. Uh, <laughs> they make all these assumptions about me. But, uh, but yeah, I started in Little Rock. So I, I was going to like the Looney Bin open mics and, uh, there's this place called the joint that I used mm -hmm. to go to all the time. Um, but yeah, I was there for like two years and then I went to LA for, for like four and now I'm here. Awesome. Well, congrats on your journey and congrats on getting the opportunities you're getting. You're doing an amazing job. You, you're a different breed. You're a, a musician slash comic. So you do a lot of songs and stuff, which can prevent can present its own set of challenges more than I would mean to say prevent, but present challenges. How yeah. do you, how do you go about like trying to I guess lyric and musically I guess come up with the material? Oh, uh, I mean that's an interesting question because it's not like uh, it's not like the same at least for me every time. I know like some like songwriters say, oh, I always write the words first, or I always write the music first. I think Billy Joel is like a he's a music first guy. And he says the reason we didn't start the fire, at least he thinks it's a bad song because he wrote the words first uh, <laughs> and he didn't write the music. But for me, I don't know. It's like, I, I it'll either start with uh, an idea or a feeling. And if it's an idea, that's like, I guess a lyrical start. And if it's a feeling, that's usually more of a, more of a musical start. So um, it depends. And then I, I work out tags and, and like, um, and like punchlines, uh, you know, kind of like any other comic, maybe with a little more structure at like an open mic. You know, I can't like riff in the same way, but um, uh, it, it's it's similar enough, you know. You just gave me a, a great idea. Like if you could do crowd work musician, just be like a minstrel on stage and just do crowd work. Like it's all just, yeah. hey, what do you do? <laughs> just start. Yeah, I do a little bit of that. Um, there's a guy named uh, Morgan J who does like singing crowd work. If you've ever seen him, he plays a guitar and does singing crowd work. And it's, it's pretty cool, man. That's, like, that's gotta be super interesting. Cause it's almost like you're the yeah. guitar guy at the party that just playing to impress people. Yeah. Hopefully you, you're the guitar guy who was invited to the party and not the guitar guy who like found the guitar, like hidden away at the party that they didn't want anybody to play. You know, that's every hyena's green room. There is a guitar that should, that's just there for people to riff on it's me. yeah so since you're like you've got you're now moved up to i guess being a middle act here i guess in our scene as well as i guess probably wherever you go as far as you know middling you you're doing it as an mc yeah. for a little bit but you're a middle act which i think gives you more freedom so you're not 
you don't have to drop the guitar for anything at this point. You can go yeah. for 20, 25 minutes without having to worry about, okay, now the rest of the show, I've got to be just an announcement guy. And that's got to be an yeah, exciting it's, feeling. Uh, uh, I mean, it feels good. Um, I don't mind hosting. I like hosting. Um, I host a, a show, my my uh, roommate and I, Sean, we also do a show together uh, called Very Serious Club. Um, mm-hmm. we, we just started producing a show in Austin. Uh, and I like hosting, um, but I guess in like, in, in like a club setting, you know, versus a sh- showcase, like club setting, I like being in the middle because uh, my act is so different. And I feel like sometimes going up, like when people are there to see comedy and like walking on stage with a guitar, it kind of confuses people. And I feel like I maybe have like just kind of that extra step I need to take to get everybody on the same page for the show. You know what I mean? Yeah. So as a middle, it's more like, okay, Hey, here's something a little different. We'll get back to the more familiar stuff in a minute. You're loosened up now. Here's some, here's, here's something to enjoy rather than right out the gate. Here we are. Right. Right. Versus like walking out on stage with a guitar at a comedy show and like looking the way I look, my long hair, you know, I look like, I'm going to like be singing about like breakups and and shit, you know? So it's like, so I have to like, you know, work my way through that sometimes with an audience. Um, I think it's especially in comedy clubs. I've noticed like if I go up there first, um, people are just kind of like, what's going on? Yeah. I can't imagine how your show played in little rock. Like, I feel like that was probably such a, such a culture shock for them. Like to like, what? Especially because they're Uh, well. they want country. Like they're like, okay, here comes some Garth Brooks or something. And yeah, well, in that way, Little Rock was a culture shock to me, man, because I I didn't grow up there. Um, I just moved there after. I, I used to be an actor. I, I worked mm-hmm. at a children's theater there for a couple of years. Um, so that's how I ended up there. But I grew up in South Dakota, so moving to the South was a huge culture shock for me, man. Like, um, people were. I don't know what it is. I mean, Southern hospitality, like you hear a lot about that, like when you're not from here, but it's, it's so real. It's, it's actually crazy. Like the first time I went over to somebody's house, how like almost like aggressively nice they were like, no, you have the last piece of pizza. Mm -hmm. No, you have, no, that's for you. You're the guest. So, um, I, I don't know. I like it. I, I, I prefer it. I'm glad I'm back. I'm glad we're glad to have you. And so, so what inspired you to do musical comedy? Like, so when you started stand up, what, what spoke to you to say, let me do guitar and music versus just spoken word? Uh, well, I mean, in Little Rock, um, well, I've gone back now, but in Little Rock, I only ever did uh, uh, regular stand up. Okay. For, so my first two years, maybe, maybe almost three years, honestly, um, we're all, I was, I was just doing traditional stand up, and I wanted to play the guitar. I wanted to pick it up, but I didn't want to be that guy. <laughs> I wanted to like, you know, I wanted to, and, and also like coming from a the- theatrical background, uh, when you, when you like study acting, there's, there's a big emphasis, emphasis placed on like, uh, and this is probably any discipline, like really learn the rules and make sure you understand like the rules and the structure of something before you start defying them, before you start breaking the rules and defying structure. So I, I was very conscious of that. And I stopped myself from playing the guitar for, for years. And then I, when I moved to LA um, and started doing shows and these open mics and stuff, um, I just kind of noticed there were, there were a lot of like uh, guys like me, just, you know, straight white dudes from the Midwest talking about their dicks. So I was like, what can I do? What do I have that these people don't have? And I was like, well, I've been singing my whole life. I've been, you know, making music my whole life. And, I, and that's finally when I was like, okay, I have to stand out. I have to do something to stand out. Yeah, to, to stand out of this crowd. And then when I picked the guitar up and started writing, the first two songs I wrote uh, were were just they just crushed, dude. They were just killers, like right away. And so I was like, "There's something to this." And now it's it's all I do. I just I just write the funny songs. That's awesome. So when did you start in music? So what got you into music? Uh, well, I knew, I guess like very young, very young age, I was, I'd be like singing in the grocery store and stuff, like sitting in the cart, singing in the grocery store or so I hear, I don't really remember any of that. That's just, you know, you have to take Mary Eggleston's word for that. But, um, I, uh, I, I always like was musical. And then in like, um, fourth or fifth grade, when they start like, like letting you be in band and stuff, I like started playing the saxophone and the cello 
and I didn't really like the saxophone. I liked the cello a little more, but that still wasn't quite my quite my thing. Mm-hmm. And then I was in a music class in sixth grade, and we were just doing like you know do re mi shit. And um, the teacher like you know pulled me aside, and he was like, "You really need to join chorus. You really need to be in chorus." And I said, "Well, I'm already in band and orchestra. I, I can't do another one." He's like, "You need to figure out how to be in chorus." He was like, like gravely serious. Uh, a guy named John Mogan, very, very good guy. Um, and he, so he um, basically convinced me to quit saxophone and join chorus. And then when I started singing, dude, I couldn't get enough of it. I joined, my voice hadn't changed yet. I joined like a boys choir. I was an alto till I was like 16. Uh, I started taking voice lessons and then I found theater and musical theater. So I started doing that in high school and then I went to college for that. Um, so yeah, I've been singing forever and then, and it just kind of all ended up rolling into what i do now uh as, as a stand-up so what kind of monster are you on the karaoke like when it when karaoke comes around like how much of a like Dude. when you come when you come up people just underestimate you because they just see scrawny white guy long hair yeah and then you just yeah then i go up there and sing some fucking queen and they change their minds man <laughs> do you have the vocal range of of uh freddie mercury oh Oh yeah. I mean, if you want to get into the weeds, like, like, I, like I was in that boys choir, you know, like the Vienna boys choir, not yeah. that one, but you know, choir of, of, of they're generally little boys, but yeah. I was like 15, 16 in this choir. Cause my, my voice hadn't changed yet. Um, and then when my, my voice never, like a lot of guys, I don't know how it was for you or how conscious you were of it, like growing up, but like when you're a singer, you're very conscious of voice changing. Mm-hmm. And like, we would literally like in middle school, high school, like, a guy would be in, in class one day, he'd be like a tenor, and then he'd come to school the next day, and his voice was just like bass, low, you know, a very sudden change. And that never happened to me, um, maybe because I was singing so much, my voice never changed. It just kind of got a little bit lower, mm-hmm. just like a little bit lower. So I've been, you know, I, I sing really, I sing very high. That's what I was like known for in college, I guess, if I was known for anything. So you're almost like Tiny Tim, like you just... You just had, you're able to keep the higher, the higher pitches where everybody else. Yeah, I don't know. Tiny Tim isn't a very flattering, uh, <laughs> flattering comparison, Ryan, but, uh, <laughs> but I guess I have to take it. I'll take it. Okay. I'll take it. I know you're, it didn't come from a place a, from, of yeah, malice. Yeah. You're a modern day Weird Al. Like you, like Weird Al Yankovic is someone from my generation that took music and yeah. comedy and I think like created such a, you know, a unique like space that now kind of everyone that does kind of comedy music kind of could stem from but it was such a diversion back in the day to to have someone be talented musically but then to just parody all these popular songs and it was just he would it just it made his career from the get-go like i remember how i got so young and when that came out and i was just like blown away by you know eat it and all the other ones that he did and it was just it was clever it was well done it wasn't you know just a butchering of a song it was really quality right. music yeah that's what made him so good or makes him so good i guess is that he he really is a good a good musician and i mean the problem you you see with so many um so many musical comedy acts is just the like either the jokes aren't very good or the music isn't very good mm-hmm. um so I, I like to think that both both my jokes and my music are good. And I mean, I think that's why why it works. I just see so many people like half ass the guitar. You know, they, they they can't really play. And it's like, just tell a joke, man. Yeah. You'd, you'd be better off without that. Because 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 like it becomes like if you're not like because when I'm on stage with my guitar, it really feels like an extension of me. You know, I feel like, OK, this is who I am. This is like my voice, you know, whatever that that kind of cheesy stuff that that is truly how I feel. And then I watch some people. And it's either like they're hiding behind it or or they're just not that competent with it. So it becomes this clunky thing that's just like kind of in their way, you know. Um, and I guess, you know, those are my fears. Uh, you know, another, another like uh, I guess like before I picked the guitar up, like those were some of the things that that were stopping me. Like mm-hmm. those thoughts like, oh, I don't want to be that guy. Yeah. I have a friend that does that was an opener that did guitar and he would do a couple of songs. He would do a few spoken word jokes and he'd pick up the guitar and he'd play a couple, he would cover a couple of songs and make them like parody. Like he has, you know, um, 
can't think of the Bruce Springsteen, but he calls it I Got Fired. And that was okay. It, and he covered Bruce Springsteen. And he's he's very he's a very talented musician. Like he's one of those people that that takes it like you are. Like you take the guitar seriously. Mm-hmm. Like that. Like he's like right. if, if I do anything with this guitar, it is go, I'm going to have all my chords. Everything's going to hit. I'm not going to half ass or not practice the guitar. So he he was very passionate about music. He was in a few bands, and so he would write these parody songs. But there's a lot of you know, he has a lot of other things. He'll be a guest on here for a few times because he's got quite a few fears himself. That Oh, really? But yeah, he's, he, but he, I, I get where you're coming from, but that you don't want, that it's, a, it's almost like an insult to your music, musician side to kind of forego the talent of the guitar to just do the spoken joke. And on the same side, it's a waste of spoken word if you're just going to play beautiful songs and not really have any kind of punchy humor. yeah yeah well in like acting school and stuff uh my issue was always that i i just wanted to be funny like mm-hmm. i didn't i didn't want to do like you know and and that's why i'm dying of, of cancer and aids like i that wasn't really my uh i just was never really interested in like playing parts like that so those were always like the the issues like oh you're not you know taking this seriously enough mm-hmm. i was like no i am taking it seriously um, but I'm being funny. It's kind of this, uh, I don't know, not, not catch 22, but almost an oxymoron to like, take, yeah. take like comedy and being silly so seriously and like, get like so worked up and angry about it sometimes. But, uh, uh, I don't know. I get the curse of the comedian, I suppose. Yeah. And the musician now. But, but I get that too. Like I get what you're saying is that I'm so serious about it that I'm already trying to specialize in what I do. That's how, that's how serious yeah. I am. In that some people want to try to try to hi- type to portray feelings that they normally wouldn't be able to do on a daily. I get I see the challenge of that, like the the drum the drama and things like that, where you know you're playing an alternative lifestyle or something else, and you're trying to bring you know justice to that by trying to put yourself in that space. And it's I'm sure as an actor, that's got to be a fun challenge to try to try to mimic and portray those feelings without being over the top or not authentic. And so I appreciate, I can see some of that ability and the passion in there. And it's just, I see where you're coming from though, too, is that, Hey, I am taking this seriously because I'm eliminating the things I don't want to do. And already it's almost like going to college and knowing what your degree or your major is going to be rather than to just go to college. Yeah. Yeah, I think I was always fated to be a comedian. I I kind of always knew that acting wasn't quite it. Like Mm -hmm. I I, I knew that I wanted to be funny and like acting was like the avenue to be funny. And, you know, but like in South Dakota, like you can't act. Good luck doing stand up. You know, I like watch stand up my whole life, but I was like, I don't know how to how do you I don't know how to do that. And it was like to me, it was like, oh, I guess you have to be an act. You have to be like on a TV show before you could be a, a comedian or whatever. So, um, once I moved to little rock and there were open mics, um, like finally like an open mic to check out, that's when it like finally clicked. I was like, Oh, this acting, this is not it. This is not it. Mm -hmm. It was like pretty much the first open mic. It was like, I was injected with jet fuel. I was like, Oh, this is what I've been chasing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I just gave, gave that acting stuff up, dude. Very accurate description. I I've never heard it that way, but that's, I call it like the it's the high that I'll always chase. Like I I I want yeah. the feeling on my first time, but with the education of all the things that I've learned, and it's it's something that I can yeah. never I can't I probably will never be able to achieve, but I'll get close to it. Like I'll brush that that high feeling of of the first time, but I don't think I'll ever have yeah. the. I'm still up at two in the morning after my first open mic believe, saying, oh, my God, I can't believe I just did this. Yeah. Yeah, dude. I mean, I, my first one, like, didn't even go that well. And I was like, it was like a 10 minute open mic. These, these crazy people in Little Rock, there were there were like three comedians. So the open mic was 10 minutes. And they're like, yeah, normally everybody gets 10 minutes. I was like, I'll take I'll take two. <laughs> I don't know. I guess the acting and stuff, a lot of people like, I guess like when they're starting out, be like, yeah, give it, give mm-hmm. me 10. I'm a headliner or whatever. They don't even know the, like the terminology, but like, I was like very conscious of like, Oh no, I've been doing like three hour Shakespeare plays. I know how much work goes into one scene of that. 
And here I am by myself. I'll take two minutes. That, that's, uh, I'll take two and then I'll just watch. So they let me go first and just like eat it, you know, a couple chuckles or whatever. But mm-hmm. uh, I was, I was totally hooked, dude. And when I met the comedians, you know, like the fact that there were just comedians in, in Little Rock, Arkansas blew my mind, man. I mean, they're, they're even more now. There are like 30 comics in Little Rock now, but it's like, I mean, there were maybe 10 of us at this, at this open mic. And it, it was just like, yeah, I don't know. I just feel like I just like jumped, jumped into the deep end, dude. I, I really didn't have any hesitation. Kind of, I mean, the same way I was mm-hmm. when I discovered like singing yeah. and, and my, and that I was like a singer and that I liked singing. It was, the comedy was like the exact same thing. It was like, okay, I do this now. This is what I do now. Well, that's awesome. I, 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 you're the only person I know that would say, you know, that would you know, try to do little less than 10. Like, I feel like anybody would do what they, yeah. that they tried to give them. <laughs> but it's in, I, I always enjoy listening to comics and stuff that come from like the theater background that talk about like because some of the stuff you're aware of other things you're not like to me I feel like when you come from a theater background you're very aware of staging you're very aware of knowing how to make yourself present your no elocution of voice oh yeah well you're you're comfortable in front of people yeah. right like that I never had to work on that as mm-hmm. a stand-up I, I mean I guess in like minor ways you know but like as far as like a base like I was not nervous in front of people. That was just not on my like, not yeah. on my like uh, work list for a while. Yeah, but they, I say the only downside is because you're so well acting is that a lot of actors and as a defense mechanism will have a character instead of oh ha- yeah. And there's there's a level of inauthentic authenticity to what they're saying. It's almost like it's a rehearsed and yeah, it can be hit or miss. Like you 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 early on you'll you'll be way better, but as you progress through the people that can actually kind of, I guess, bear their soul that kind of, yeah, those are the ones that, that go further. And it sometimes I think it's hard for a theater person to actually, I guess, almost work past all that training and acting lessons to actually be who they are instead of who they want to be. Oh, I mean, as someone who spent a lot of time around theater people, uh, them being like fake and unable to be themselves. I don't think that has anything to do with the acting lessons. It's, it's more so a <laughs> personality thing. Um, but uh, no, I hear what you're saying. You're there. There's definitely some truth to that. Like um, I've definitely seen some like, pe- more, like theatrical people who go up there and it's, it's like, uh, it's like you just hit play on a, on like a recording. Yes. You know, you hit play and they just, they, you know, do their act the same way. It's the same thing every time. Uh, and then the recording ends and they get off stage as opposed to, I don't know, someone from a non, like, uh, a non-scripted background, let's call it, who goes up there and is a little looser and maybe it does like crash and burn, but at least they're like present in the moment. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I went to a very good, I, I, I do need to give my school credit though. I went to a very good, um, acting school. It's called Mill- Milliken University. It's in, uh, bumpfuck nowhere, Illinois, but it's a very good school. And especially towards the end of our um, training, as we became more focused on like, you know, here's how you're going to be a working actor. Uh, You know, you're going to be doing these auditions. We did like a year of audition technique classes. Mm -hmm. And those classes are less about like portraying a role, portraying a character and and truly more about like, how do you present yourself? How do you like, how do you, you know, because when you go into a room for an acting audition for like Broadway or whatever, you're in there for like a minute, minute and a half. So these classes were like, focus on like how do you like i don't know wrap up your personality how do you distill yourself mm-hmm. into like a, a very easy to understand almost like bite size um chunk so that when you walk into a room people know who you are um and i, I think that you know something that is definitely something that i struggled with um mm-hmm. but i think those lessons really like i find myself coming back to that kind of that stuff all the time when like i get off stage i'm like why didn't that feel good why wasn't that i don't know why didn't that feel real yeah. you know i was like phoning it in what's going on it's like oh you're not really being you you're just kind of going up there and saying the words you know i mean kind of like what i was saying before when you go up there and just hit play yeah on the soundtrack instead of um being in the room like being alive with the people you know yeah. i'd always try to put myself in peril like i'll try to i'll i'll try different things i'll have different agendas i will i will mix it up and just try to, I was like, 
let's put myself in in a situation and see if I could work my way out of it. Like I've tried. Yeah, I like do, that. I like to do different sets. Like I don't do my, I don't write everything out. I do it. I do a main idea and then I just kind of form the joke around it so that each time it's a little different. Like there yeah. are some things that are the same, but it's not word for word. It's not a lot. It's not a lines in a play. It's something kind of free form. Yeah that can stand on its own that I don't have to pair with somebody else or segue into or segue out of. And it just kind of, I just kind of mix and match and just constantly plug and play. Yeah. Well, you gotta, you gotta change it up. You gotta like, um, make yourself uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Um, and like, uh, like, I don't know whether that, whether that means like, like you said, like putting yourself in peril, like basically like handicapping yourself or something mm-hmm. before you get on stage. Like, Oh, I'm not going to let myself say, um, or, you know, tonight or, or it's as big or, or it's like, okay, I'm going to go to this room where I fucking eat shit every week and I'm going to keep going because, uh, it's like it, you know, I'm, I'm uncomfortable. And, and, uh, if you want, you know, when you start to get comfortable is when your act dies, I think. Like, you know, you, you know, some of these guys who have been doing the road for 20 years and their act hasn't changed in 10, it's like, uh, you know, they're just, they're just comfortable. They're not doing sets that, um, that, um, change it up. They're not putting themselves in peril anymore. They're just like kind of locked in and cruising, yeah. you know? And I never want to be that. I was like, I always just want to like, cause no. it's going to be fun for me. Like, I feel like at that point, like, mm-hmm. what am I doing? I'm doing, it's a job now. Yeah. How is that any different? How is that any different than clocking into work and filling out, you know, the same like data sheet every day, you know, going into work, saying the same thing every night and going home to me, it feels it's like, that's, that's what I'm trying not to do. I'm trying to not do the same thing every day. I'm trying to have every day be different. And so speaking of different, uh, this podcast is about fears and what people are afraid of. So you have a very interesting fear, which I think a lot of people do. Uh, go ahead and tell people what you're afraid of. Oh, uh, I, I'm afraid of slash hate slash don't tolerate being wrong. <laughs> and it's, I really don't like being wrong. Yeah, and it's such a prevalent fear now with Google and everything else that's... Yeah. Oh, Google's bad for me, man. I, like, look shit. I'll be, like, hanging out with friends and... And say something you're like, I don't think that's right. I'm like, oh, I'll show you. I'll show you. <laughs> you already fact checked it before you even say yeah, it. Oh, I'm, I'm a fat dude. I was fact checking way before uh, fucking Trump was in office. Okay. I've been fact checking my friends. That's awesome. I mean, even before, even before smartphones or Google, like I, I just always wanted to be right, dude. Okay. Um, yeah. It's not, not always a, not always a great or endearing quality. Uh, it can it can be I would say maybe it could be abrupt, but I it depends on where it comes from. Like how did you how did you develop this fear of being wrong? Did I don't know. I mean that's a good question, dude. You asked me that uh, like when we were setting this up, and I I honestly I I couldn't um, I I couldn't pinpoint exactly any sort of like moment. And this is funny. My mom is a therapist, so. You'd think I'd be able to do this. You know, I've been asked questions like this my entire life. Um, but yeah, I don't know that there's any specific moment. I, I'm sure some of it has to do with, um, like in school, I wasn't always, uh, well, I wasn't always, I was never popular or whatever, you know, I mean, you know, shocker. I know that's like not a story that you ever hear, but I wasn't like cool. I wasn't popular. So like a lot, you know, it came down to like, oh, I'm smarter than you. Like I know more than you, that kind of stuff. Um, so that a lot of times, like, that would be like my only defense was like, you know, at least I like, you know, you know, you called me gay or whatever, but at least I know more than you, Yeah, you know? And it's like, and I guess maybe it's like, oh, but if I don't actually know more than them, then I really am just stupid and gay. Like, (laughs) like they're saying, so maybe, maybe there's some of it rooted in that dude. You know, I, I like to think that I've like, uh moved on, you know, at least in like my day to day, um, from like, you know, stuff from, I mean, that's like 10, 15 years ago at at this point, you know, high school. So, you know, I, I like to think I've moved past that mostly. Um, but yeah, that was like the most, I guess, like, what, 
what formative example of like where where this comes from you know like not not wanting to be wrong and then some of it is also maybe like uh you know i'm, I'm an older brother okay um and so you know like when you you know my and my little brother um you know i like to think he looks up to me especially when he was younger you know so i didn't want to be like wrong in front of him and then he's like oh my cool older brother isn't cool anymore he's mm-hmm. he was wrong about this thing you know so I don't know. I guess a lot of it, truthfully, is just kind of rooted in like uh, ego. Yeah. Really, like, truly, like, you know, like I, I generally view myself as being smarter than than people, you know. And yeah. like, if that were to be like, if the curtain were pulled back on that, and suddenly, like, I'm wrong about all this stuff, then like, my whole life is a lie. You know, I'm not yeah. actually smarter than everybody. So that's that's I think that's really what it's rooted in. It's like my own my own ego. Yeah, and just kind of a defense, uh, almost like a social defense mechanism. Yeah, yeah, it's very, it's very defensive. Well, yeah, because you, you, like you said, people are bullying you, and it's if you're not smart, then that's another reason that they'll bully you, and you're trying to, yeah. you're trying to put you some, can't, you can't, yeah, put one in the win column for me, one in the win column. I'm losing yeah, everywhere yeah, else. I can't be, I can't be gay and stupid. At least let me be gay and smart. <laughs> gotta be it's gotta be it's, it, but i mean it, it a lot of high school bullying and stuff really makes you question also early on in stand-up makes you question these same things at a later time because oh yeah when i was younger i questioned all these things but as i got older i had these i had these same questions doing stand-up and just you eventually just learn to accept certain things about yourself yeah and through that acceptance is how you kind of embrace who you are on stage. Like, I feel like that's, to me, finding my voice was just making peace with the fact that this is who I am and that's okay. Yeah. And being I able mean, to joke I, about I, it. I feel the same way. Yeah, I feel the same way, man, especially. And it, I mean, it goes back to what, you know, I think what we said, like, earlier about, like, not getting too comfortable. Like, you want to be questioning yourself this way, I think. You know, you yeah. want to ask these questions and... You know, at a certain point, I have just kind of, you know, accepted like, you know, it's 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 definitely something that I check and work on, you know, like am conscious of. But like, you know, like I've just kind of accepted that I got kind of a big head and and that, you know, I've accepted that I'm way smarter than everybody. And that was hard to do, you know, to accept that I'm just, you know, genius levels above everyone around me. But I, you know, I managed to look inside myself and, and do that. <laughs> genius level, but doing stand-up. genius level you know <laughs> but yeah, trying to pursue yeah. a career in stand-up. genius genius brain but not genius decisions there you go you're like there you go and i've accepted that you know <laughs> and i'm and i'm okay with my decisions you're like the wily e. coyote of life <laughs> dude i wish that dude's famous dude yeah people know wiley e. coyote they don't know jeffrey certified I'll genius i'll fall off, i'll fall off a couple cliffs dude i'll 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 buy some sketchy products i don't care dude whatever it takes yeah that's the that's a that's a meta, that's such a metaphor for comedy too. Like it's you could be so intelligent and you'll just end up banging yourself against a wall repeatedly, where some you yeah. know guy does one dumb thing and he's off to the races. And he, yeah, I totally can relate. Like those were my favorite cartoons as a kid. So I've definitely oh dude, I watched I watched all that stuff on uh, uh on on like Cartoon Network uh. I don't know. They would play, they played all those old, old cartoons. Like during, there was like a certain block, maybe it was like right after school. Um, but yeah, I love that stuff. Like more slapstick stuff. Like I feel like cartoons, not to digress too much, but cartoons nowadays, I sound like a fucking old man, um, are so they're like less visual now. Like kids cartoons are like less about like the, the physical gags. And it's all just like, like the Looney Tunes revival. They're all just like talking. Yeah. And like making like clever jokes. I'm like, this isn't Looney Tunes. Looney Tunes is like head, head in the, you know, frying pan in the back of the head, coyote running into a cliff that's painted like a tunnel. You know, that's, yeah. that's Looney Tunes. It's not, it's not like talking about your day, you know, going, going on a trip to the Hoover Dam with Bugs Bunny. Like, kill it, kill yourself, dude. Waste, don't quit wasting my time. <laughs> You were not wrong about that. So there, there's one for you in the win column. Yeah, there we go. Another one. Another one in my, in my win column. So how did, how is that? How do you feel like that? Have you feel like you've gotten over it? You've kind of, I guess, made peace with it. I don't think you've, you'll ever, we'll ever truly get over some of the things that we're 
that I guess you would call our hangups and things like that. Like, you know, yeah. Yeah. For me, like hangups and like pet peeves and stuff like, um, I don't know. I, I go back and forth on this between like, how much can I really change and how much is that just part of me and how much can I just work on, um, keeping it in check more so. Cause like with me, like, uh, I mean, like out of defensiveness, like I did like early on develop this ego because because in high school I was doing theater. I was doing like these creative activities. And um, um, so. I don't know, like, is that always just going to be part of me or can I like break that? And and usually I just kind of end up in like, no, that's just, you know, that's just kind of who I am. I'll be conscious of it. But like I, I'm way better than I used to be about it. And I'm sure I'll get better about like you know, keeping myself in check, but ultimately it's like, no, that's just kind of going to be part of who I am like forever, I think. And, um, yeah, I guess, you know, if people don't want to fucking deal with that, they don't, they don't have to, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't need to be friends with everybody. I don't need everybody to think that I'm like, um, the coolest, most amazing guy who's always like so quick to tell you when he's wrong, you know? Um, I just don't need that. And I, and I feel like my close friends, like they, you know, just like I understand things about them, like they understand things about me. So, um, you know, I think finding people who understand that, like, uh, you have, like everyone has flaws and it's like finding people who are willing to, or able to deal with yours or keep yours in check is, is important. So yeah, usually I just kind of land on, you know, I'll keep working on it. I'll keep like being, um, aware of it. But I don't I don't think like my ego, especially as a performer and as like I find more success in my career, I don't think that's going anywhere. You know, yeah. <laughs> like I don't think I don't think my head is going to get smaller. Maybe I'll be able to keep it. Size relatively that it is now, but I don't think it's going to like shrink. Okay. Um, but I could, you know, I could be proven wrong. Who knows? I could turn 60 and turn into a super chill dude. But uh it didn't happen to my dad so i don't <laughs> i don't think it'll happen to me well as you get older i just think you just realize certain things like you're saying like there's an acceptance yeah. level and it's you just you stop getting worked up over certain things because it's like the more things change the more things stay the same and so i feel like like i'll talk to people and it's like it's no it's no sense getting worked over something you can't control all you all you can yeah. control is is yourself, and if you if you let this get to you, then that's just something either one if somebody has something against you can use, or you're validating somebody else that's trying to get to you that they got you, and it's like I'll never I never want to give somebody the satisfaction that they think they got to me. That's just how I sure I feel that for sure, and so I always just try to keep a level head, and sometimes you know there are things that'll that'll frustrate me in comedy and stuff. But I also was like, we're all going for the same thing. We all can't, we can't have every single opportunity. So everybody, you know, everybody's going to have some. And so it's, you know, they've, you know, everybody's done the work, you know, that they've tried to do. And it's just, some people just get so caught up looking at what other people are getting. And it's like, but how are you, you know, that's no fun for me. I'd rather work on me and see how I can get better. Yeah, dude. Uh, I mean, that's, that's another thing I got to fucking remind myself of all the time is like, stop looking at other people. You know, I mean, it's so easy, especially like, well, especially when they're like your friends mm -hmm. or your enemies. I mean, those are like, you know, the two, like, you know, the two most charged, it's like, oh, my friend is getting that. Why am I not? Or, oh, my enemy is getting that. Why am I not? You yeah. know, you can have some of those same feelings. It's very strange. Well, and it it's okay to have them, but it's not okay mm -hmm. to, I would say, dwell on them. It's okay. It's okay. To, right. It's okay to ask, why not me? And then just say, okay, well, I need to, I, there's something I need to still do. I need to find out what that is and, and work on that. Like I really, yeah. I really resonated with your thing of I'm a straight white guy in Los Angeles. Oh, you, you could be straight or gay. And Los Angeles is a comedian. It's like, you're still, you still got, a murderer's row of people that are already killing it in that, in that state, yeah. in, in that area that I'm not going to be able to just walk in and claim this niche. There are already people that are above me that are doing well and succeeding. So I need to find yeah. another way to stand out. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think 
uh, it's just about like sticking with it, man. Like I, I do think, I don't know if it's some, some people seem to think that it's like a certain number of years that you do comedy and you like unlock these abilities, but I really don't think so, dude. I think it's um, the metaphor that, Stuck, has stuck with me the most and i've heard a few headliners have told this to me have, have said like um you know it's not a sprint it's a marathon and you know we're yeah. we're all going to finish the marathon if we keep running but you have to keep running yes you're not always going to get to the five mile mark at the same time like we're not we you know we might not get there at the same time but uh if we both keep running we will both get there That's you it. know so it's 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 just like a persistence thing, right? And you and and uh, and with comedy, almost like an addiction thing, except that you really have to stick with it. Yes, and it it it's just you know I I just love the work too, and like I tell people, that's the first year. Just try to get fall in love with the monotony of open mic and the routine, and you know writing your set yeah. list, the excite the joy of writing your set list and having the new jokes on paper that you're gonna try for the week or however your process is and having the little yeah. the little joys like maybe in a room where nobody's getting laughs that oh I didn't fidget or look down at the floor at one time this time I was really yeah. you know there there're always little goals you can work on it doesn't have to just be a packed house laughing at everything you say there's other things that are always there to work on stage presence yeah. elocution you know volume you know stage fright just all kinds of yeah different like different little goals you could have in each open mic yeah well i think i think you can it's important to like learn how to fail too you know because i mean early, early on especially i mean still i still you know i still bomb i still fail it's like mm -hmm. you, you have to you have to like learn how to do that yeah and that you know um and in some ways you know i i, I don't want to necessarily say like it's my goal to fail sometimes but i mean in in a weird way sometimes it kind of is yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like sometimes like I do want to fail or, or not necessarily want to. Sometimes I need to fail. Sometimes I'm having a hot streak and I'm, you know, I start thinking, you know, I start thinking, I, you know, I can't do anything wrong. You know, my fear, you know, I, I can't be wrong. And then I go up there and, you know, just eat shit and, you know, big stinky bomb. And it's like, oh yeah. Okay. Thanks for the reminder. Yeah. You know, that was, that was important to have that. Yes, that I was going to ask you about that. Like, do the, the, you equate bombing to being wrong because you're you have a, a preconceived notion of how? Oh, that's a, that's an interesting question. Um, sometimes you know, because like you know, bombs are different. Like, um, I'm not somebody who who subscribes to like the the philosophy that it's it's never the audience's fault. I think it's usually the comedian's fault. But every once in a while, you do get some like just just a bad audience. Yeah, you know, there's people who like don't want to be there. Yeah. Um, so like stuff like that, you know, that's, that's less like that, if anything makes me feel more right. I'm like, those people just didn't know. They just didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. But yeah, I mean like, yeah, being like bombing. Yeah. It definitely feels like I did something. Well, I, I mean, it, it means and feels like I did something wrong, yeah. you know, like that is like, that's like the, a direct manifestation of, Hey, you were wrong. Whatever you did up there, that was wrong. Yeah. The right thing. And so I don't know. I mean, honestly, comedy, especially as I get deeper into it and, and I, um, you know, uh, get better. Honestly, I mean, really, it just helps me with, with that kind of stuff with like ego checking. It's, it's, it's actually, uh, I mean, versus theater for sure. Like, uh, the, the cycle is nice. I feel like, you know, you like rise for a while, you're like killing it for a while. And then you, you take a hit just inevitably you're going to take some sort of hit, even when you're big and famous, you know, like, in, in some respect, you, you're going to take some sort of hit and get knocked down a peg. And, um, I mean, for someone like me with like my, my issues, like that's super important. Yeah. It's super important for me to fail. I agree. I think it's, it's important for everyone to fail. That's why it's like, I, I prescribed to something that if you're really struggling with your confidence and stuff, go up last at open mics because that is the best way to work on your confidence. Just to sit there in an empty room yeah. And just kind of work it out and not have to worry about everything that's happening. You don't have to worry about getting laughs or anything. You're just going up there and saying it over and over. I felt like that was what really, I guess, took me from a good writer and not good performer to a good writer and a good performer. 
And then from there, it just evolved because I was just, I was, I'm not shakable. You can't shake me if I'm in a full mm-hmm. room when there's silence because anybody that just goes up in a full showroom and then nothing happens when they were expecting a laugh, they're shook. And now they're all the same. Yeah. They start to backpedal and try to try to roll out some other material and stuff that they weren't planning to do to try to get back on track. And then, and then it just snowballs. Yeah. And- uh, yeah, you put on this, you're, you're put on this aura that you're, you're nervous and scared. And all of a sudden now the audience is going to reflect that they're nervous and scared because the person they're looking to, to lead them is now shaken. And so it's, yeah, it just, bec- well, you're, it's, it, that's an interesting way to put it. The person to lead them. Cause like when you're, when you have a microphone on a stage, like, um, kind of like it's it's like the way people are conditioned you do have some of the same like powers that like uh like a preacher would have or like a pastor would have you know like at least for a little bit yes like people are listening to you and you do kind of have that control of them so if, um you know if you if you go up there and like and it's quiet and you're like chill with it like i've been here before the audience is they're not going to even they might not even notice it yeah. You know, whereas if you, you know, I see last night I saw people saying, oh, you didn't like that one. Yeah. Oh, was that too blank for you? It's like, no, dude, it just wasn't funny. And yeah. you're revealing you're revealing uh, your your practice habits to to the comedians in the back right now. Yeah. Well, I thank you for doing this. Jeffrey. Yeah. This has been an awesome conversation. So you've got some. Oh, my pleasure, man. This should come out before your shows. So when are you going to be featuring at Hyenas? Oh, I'm going to be featuring at a Hyenas Fort Worth. Uh, oh, let me look at my calendar. I think I know the dates off the top of my head, but I don't want to confuse anybody. Um, yeah, December 2nd through 4th. Okay. And then I'll also be back featuring on December 9th. So I got four four oh. days of, of awesome. uh, raucous laughs at Hyenas coming up. I'm trying to think if that's Jenny Zagrino or Ben Glebe on the Fort Worth calendar. Um, I think Ben is at is it is in the is it dallas okay so. So it's probably jenny then oh that's cool i would think and it's when i got it there wasn't anybody listed okay. but maybe i'm maybe i'm thinking yeah. of i'm thinking of it but i i can't be sure i know jenny got put on the calendar recently but it could be with jenny okay. Sabrina, who's super awesome uh, yeah that'd be tight we could be wrong and then uh, i also have a oh go ahead as if we are wrong i'll correct it in the preamble and postamble of who is actually going to be whatever. there yeah edit i'll just yeah. dub it in <laughs> yeah and then i've uh, i've got a a show i do with my roommate i mentioned earlier it's a uh, at very serious club on all platforms um it is uh, it looks like a podcast but it's it's a fake podcast we just do like 15 second clips from a podcast that doesn't exist that's awesome um we have a video about uh nikki minaj that's really upsetting people right now so um check that out on instagram at very serious club if um if you don't have the time for a real podcast um, after this and you just want some 15 second uh, fake podcast. Awesome. We'll definitely check that out. Uh, where can people find you if they want to follow you on social media? And uh, My handle is uh, at Jeff eggs on everything. G E O F F eggs. Um, and I post like stand up clips, crowd work stuff, music stuff. Um, not super often. The very serious we post every day, uh, but I post like, something maybe once a month well awesome but it's a you're doing amazing work can't wait to see your feature weekend here at fort worth i look forward to seeing you again here in town when you're back uh talk to you soon yeah man i'll see you soon ryan so that was jeffrey i really relate to his fear about being wrong because i was bullied a lot as a kid and not really well liked so you tend to play to your strengths. Mine was being weird. Jeffrey's was being passionate about being correct. And so it's a very, very relatable fear of just being, having feeling that something's maybe being taken away from you. I totally relate to that. Check out Jeffrey. He's an amazing comic. Uh, he was just at Fort Worth this weekend uh, with Renee Garcia. Next week, he will be at the 325 show in Dallas on the 9th. You can go check that out at hyenascomedynightclub.com. 
Follow Jeffrey Eggleston on social media. I'll have the links for that in the show notes. As for myself, I just got back from driving from all the way from Odessa, so I'm a little frazzled. Um, I got I left about nine in the morning. I drove to Odessa the night day before, so my Friday was and Saturday were mostly spent on I twenty going back and forth. I had a great show with James Johan at the Odessa Country Club as well as the uh, hotel bar where we performed as well. Sold a couple of shirts. It was a fun night. Thanks again to JC Faust for for booking me on that and perhaps maybe one of these times I'll have him on the podcast, but he's also a big police person and Odessa, so he's got a really busy schedule. Other shows I've got coming up. Uh, next week, the 11th, I will be at the Brazos Theater in Waco, Texas, performing. And then it might just be the rest of the year for me. Um, the last two weeks of the year, I'll just take off. It's been a great year in comedy for me. Super excited. I've done more work in comedy than I ever have, and... It's been nice. I, I really enjoyed it, and I'm hoping to add a few more to the rotation in the coming years. Just having fun doing stand-up and all kinds of stuff. You can catch me in January, the first weekend of January the 2nd and 6th, and the Looney Bin, Looney Bin Wichita with Damon Harris. And I will also be with Damon Harris in Oklahoma City the following weekend, the 12th and 16th. You can get those at looneybin.com. It'll be fun shows. Uh, after that, I will be at Hyenas in Fort Worth with Rob Little. Come check out those shows. I should be recording those for a potential comedy album. More to come on that, as Travis Wright has agreed to be available and there to record my sets that weekend. That'll be a fun time. I look forward to doing that and kind of getting prepared to do so. So it should be a really, really exciting jan month of January for me, and then hopefully more dates to follow. As for guests, I've got more comics coming up. I've kind of haven't asked a lot of other people to be on the podcast just because the holiday season, I didn't want to interrupt too much family time and kind of take away from that. And so I've ta I've gotten enough episodes to get me through the holidays. And then after that, I'll start asking again, probably in mid January, you know, to, to start scheduling people to interview as well as maybe get a couple of comics at the Low Key Tavern to kind of fill the time. If you'd like to be a guest, email me at somefearfans at gmail.com and we can discuss it. I will kind of put some feelers out there for certain people. I've gotten a few comics. I've got a podcaster as well, still in the can. A couple of podcasters, actually. So... Listen for those. Those will be coming out here in the coming weeks. I wish you guys a happy holidays. I I know some of Hanukkah has already started, so mazel tov for, for those. And thanks again for listening. If you like what you hear, leave a review wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks again for listening to the Some of All Fears podcast. And now some thank yous for the folks that make this show possible. Thanks to Barry Whitewater for my art and graphics. You can follow him on Instagram at bwhiteh2o. Get it? H2O, like water. You can also follow him on Facebook. Music. A huge thank you to Gunnar Olson for the wonderful music provided for this podcast. You can follow him on Instagram at gunbuns, that's G-U-N-B-U-N-S, as well as his website, gunnarolson.net. Check out some of the samples that he has recorded. They're amazing. He's an amazing percussionist. If you want to follow the show, we've got a Facebook group, Some of All Fears. Instagram, Twitter, you can find us at Some Fear Fans. 
If you have some feedback for the show, email me at somefearfans, S-O-M-E-F-E-A-R-F-A-N-S at gmail.com. I'll be happy to, to take those into consideration. Also, if you'd like to be a guest, email me at somefearfans at gmail.com. We can try to iron out some details and get that settled in. You know, give us some feedback if on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Leave a review. It makes the show bigger, and it's not going anywhere. I'm going to record as many in- shows as I possibly can. If you want to follow me on social media, I am at Ryan Perio. It's R-Y-A-N-P-E-R-R-I-O on all social media platforms. You can follow me there, and you can check me out at ryanperio.com, my website. I'll try to list upcoming shows there as well. It's been kind of spotty because as soon as I set it up, that's when the pandemic happened. And everything's kind of just in a in a holding pattern. Thanks again for listening to the Sum of All Fears podcast. Next week, we'll have another guest with another fear. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.